And so, hallelujah, there is a word from the Lord. If I say this name, let me know if you remember it or you know it. Kendrick Castillo. Kendrick Castillo. Yeah, remember that name? That was a young man that was killed in the STEM shooting in Parker, Colorado. Yeah, there's so many mass shootings going on. And, and I contend that that is not just because there's no prayer in school. I, I contend because there's no salvation in the people. And, and, and that we don't know our identity. And we don't know who we are and whose we are. That, that we are created in the image of God. And I believe if we all begin to, un to understand that, then we would begin to love one another. Kendrick Castillo did not strike me as a, a kid who would charge a gunman. If you look at him, right? Right? But guess what? God works through those who, are who we are inclined to reject. God works through those who we are inclined to reject. Today we're going to look at this lady, this woman. Her name is Rahab the prostitute. Rahab the harlot. And it's a familiar passage. And so we're going to look at how God uses those that we're inclined to reject. See, because Rahab does not strike me as someone that God would have a purpose and a plan for. So I'm going to ask you, Eddie, to put up my first slide, and then I'm going to pray. Hallelujah, 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 God. We just thank you this morning, God. We love you. We praise you. We honor you. We lift you up. We thank you for your blood, God. We ask you, God, that you move me out of the way, Lord. We ask you, God, that you come forth and you speak a word, Lord, because somebody needs to know that they matter. Somebody needs to know that they're valued. Somebody needs to know, Lord, that you can use even them, Lord. That you have a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. We love you, we praise you, and we honor you in your mighty son, Jesus' name. A amen. Say amen. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. So our story begins with the Israelites standing on the shore, getting ready to finally walk into the promised land. Amen. They've been waiting mainly because of their own fault. They've been, they were in Egypt for 400 years. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And here they are at the shore, are ready to go in. Moses had died, and now Joshua was their new leader. So right before they go in, Joshua sent some spies over. Remember the spies from Moses? They, brought, they didn't bring back a good report. But Joshua sends two spies over to Jericho, and they come back with a good report. We can defeat them. With the help of the Lord. Amen. So my big idea today, it says when God orders our steps, he saves us. He redeems us. He rescues us for his plans and for his purposes. And my preaching idea is this. God works through those that we are inclined to reject. Yeah, yeah. Somebody said, come here, Rahab, the prostitute. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, since there's a lot of verses, rather than reading all of them at one time, I'm just going to take them in chunks. Is that okay? So that means you're going to have to leave your Bible open. You're going to have to leave your, your iPad or your phone at Joshua chapter 2. Beginning at verse 1, I'm going to read 1 through 7. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from, I'm going to say this very carefully so y'all don't think I'm cussing, and don't tell pastor I'm cussing, Sha Tim. Did I get it? I ain't going to say it no more. As spies, <laughs> saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman, sorry, but the woman, come on, 
But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, true, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. She just lying. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Hmm. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fort, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. I got on my glasses, but I still need it to be larger, so sorry. <laughs> okay, so here we are seeing the spies being sent to Jericho to scout out the land. Can you go to the next screen? So my first point is this, that God orders the steps of those that are inclined to be rejected. The spies are sent over to Jericho to scout out the land, okay? And they stay at an inn that's ran by Rahab, the prostitute. In those days, spies are sent to, to collect information from the enemy, right? They, they check and see what the troop size is, what the defenses are, what the food and the water supply is, and just for a general preparedness to prepare them for their attack or their siege, right? And we have to learn something about Jericho. Jericho was about five miles from the Jordan River, so not that far. Jericho was a walled city. In biblical times, a lot of cities were walled and gated. Jericho was a gated community. <laughs> okay. And so what the walls do, they're, they're defensive mechanisms. And, and they fortify against the aggressor or the enemy. And then the gates, they're usually left open during the day, but then at night they would close the gates for the same reason to, to uh, use it as a barrier and an opposition. But here's what's so interesting. You see, God had already promised Abraham that this land was going to be given to Israel. So a, a theologian said this, that the walls um, and the gates stand as a barrier and an opposition to the advancement of the kingdom of God. Amen. That was good, y'all. Amen. So he promised the land as a covenant. And then when Jericho would close the gates, it's as if they were resisting the opposition. And the opposition is God. Now we all know if we read the whole story. Joshua fought the battle at Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Don't you know that we cannot thwart God's plans? No walls, no gates, no nothing, no enemy can thwart the plans of God. So it's interesting to me why he would want to send some spies over there when all God has to do is supernaturally knock down which he does. But I began to wrestle with that thing. And, I, and, and what was so interesting, almost the whole chapter of chapter two is about Rahab. And I said, Lord, is it just that she hid the spies? So God was like, no, she needed to be saved. Because I have a bigger plan and purpose for her. That's Rahab, the prostitute. So, someone saw the spies going into Rahab, the king of Jericho, went to her house and asked for, the, for her to send the spies. And then she told a big fat lie. She had hit them on the roof. She said she didn't know where they went. They left and, and sent these pursuers on a wild goose chase. Now, why would they go to Rahab's house? I don't know. Maybe they didn't want to be noticed but they were 
And so, like I said earlier, I think and I contend that it was the providence of God. It was a divine appointment, a divine assignment. It, lead, it was leading her to her destiny. Yeah, because God works through those that we are inclined to reject. Yeah, he orders our steps, amen, for his plans and for his purpose. Ephesians 1 and 11 says, in him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Oh, it was his purpose and his will that these spies would go over into the land and stay at the house or the inn of Rahab, the prostitute. So she hides them on the roof. And I just find it very interesting that she lied. But in seminary, we learned this little, little phrase. It says, it was not prescriptive, but descriptive. You heard that one? <laughs> well, it wasn't that God ordains lying. He does it. It was just a description of what happened. <laughs> All right? So don't, don't y'all think y'all could be going around lying. Okay. It was not prescriptive. <laughs> just a description. It's interesting that the author says she sent them on the roof and, and laid some flax. Just was very intricate and detailed about that. And I was like, what is it about the flax? Well, the flax led me to the, the, the Proverbs woman, Proverbs 31. And, and, and she, uh, she selects wool and flax and, and works with her eager hand. And then I began to, to wonder, okay, Rahab, the prostitute, that somebody that we would reject has a characteristic, at least one, of a noble, virtuous woman. You see, God orders our steps for his plans and his purpose. And he orders the steps of those that are inclined to be rejected. Her character may have been questionable, but how many of you know that our character does not define our destiny? Amen. Somebody needs to know that. Our character does not define our destiny, who they say we are, who we might even think we are, may not be who God knows we are. Hallelujah. This morning I was on my way to inn and I stopped at Walgreen and there was this young man standing outside and he asked me for a dollar. And I hardly ever, never carry cash. But guess what? I had cash this morning. And so he looked like, he looked like a crackhead to me. So I went in and, you know, you know, when you get to being in the word all night preparing, you know, the Holy Spirit is just all over you. So I went in the store and I just began to pray over him. And God told me an amount of money to give him. And don't worry about what he does with it. He needs to know who he is. So I came out and I said, my name is Pastor Karen. What is your name? And he said, I'm Isaac. You know why? Because his name was important to me. I wanted him to know that he was of value. I said, I've prayed for you. And the Lord told me to give you this. And no matter what you do with it, I'm not, that's between you and him. But I want you to know that he loves you and you are of value. Yeah. Because God orders the steps of those that we are inclined. So why would Rahab hide the spies from, his, from her own people? Let's go. Y'all still got your Bibles open? Okay, verse 8. Verse 8 through 12. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof. And said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Huh. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea 
before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. And we'll stop there. And here's our next point. When God orders our steps, he puts us on a path of redemption. Yeah. Right. Right. He works through those who are rejected. Then he takes us and puts us on a path of redemption or salvation. Okay, so she hid him from her own people. She turned her loyalty away from her own people to these men she didn't even know. Why? Why? And it's right here. It said because she had heard, she heard, that's a key word, about the God of Israel who does supernatural things. See, you have to understand she was a Canaanite. They worshiped idol gods. She was a prostitute. She was a woman. All odds were against her. But she, she jeopardized her own life by telling a lie and hiding these spies of whom she did not know. All because she heard about a God from Israel, of Israel. I think she also heard of Romans 10 and 14 because it says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Somebody might have been bootlegging the gospel. I don't know because the word don't say that there was preachers or missionaries in Jericho but somehow she heard about God almighty and 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 she in her hearing believed see when we hear and we begin to believe then we change and turn our loyalty from the world to the Lord she made a confession of faith. I don't know if you realize that. She made a confession of faith when she said that the Lord your God in heaven above and the earth below. That was her confession of faith. And then she asked the spies to swear by Jehovah. That was another instance of her acknowledging God as the one and true living God. And so you say to me, well, how can she do that? Okay. Romans 10 and 8 says, the, what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth it is, and in your heart. The word of faith we are proclaiming that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. She believed and had so much faith that she even lied. Okay? But here's the thing, and I know some of y'all scholars are saying, well, Jesus would, that was the Old Testament. But guess what? The Old Testament saints were saved by their faith, and they looked forward to Christ. The New Testament saints are saved by grace through faith, and we look back to what Christ did. Yeah, you don't believe me? Go to Galatians and read in Romans. Paul breaks it all down for you. Okay? <laughs> so she made a confession because when God orders our steps, he puts us on a path of redemption. Before I was saved, I could not, did not, would not understand. It didn't make any sense. I went to Sunday school. I went to church church it didn't make any sense but one day it's just like overnight 
it all just made sense. You see, I had to be on the path of redemption in order for God's plans and purposes for me to come forth. Amen. I could not follow in his path in the way that I was rejected. Whoever I was, Karen the. Karen the. Annette the. Steve the. We couldn't stay that way. So he put us on a path of redemption. And when he puts us on a path of redemption, he rescues us from death and destruction. Okay, let's go. Let's look at 12B all the way to 20. I may paraphrase some of this. So we're rescued from death and destruction. You can go to the next slide, Eddie. <clears throat> now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. You also will deal kindly with my, I'm sorry, and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And so the men go on and just tell her, okay, as long as you don't tell, then we'll do what you ask. And she tells them to, to, to go. And, and here's something interesting. She let them down by a rope through the window. I was like, ooh. See them sneaking out the window of a prostitute's house? <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I'm a little silly. Okay, so she let them out through the window and uh, told them to go on their way, told them to hide for three days and their pursuers will come back here and then they can go on their way to Joshua to make their report. Verse 17, the men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet or red cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and we shall be guilt guiltless. And then he goes on and explains, you know, that they needed to be in the house if they were going to be saved. They needed to be protected in the house. Yeah, that's a whole different sermon. Amen. Yeah, they needed to be in the house to be protected. And then she said, according to your words, verse 21, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed. And here's the interesting and the good thing about this passage. She tied the scarlet cord in the window. Yeah, God orders our steps and he rescues us from death and destruction. A theologian said this, Rahab's open window becomes the solution to the closed gate. Remember when they, she told us, when she sent the, the pursuers, they closed the gate, right? And so the open window symbolizes, according to this theologian, the openness of Rahab and her family. It gave access to Rahab and her family. It gave them access to Israel and Israel's God. Amen. The open window provided access to life. Hallelujah. God gives us a... a uh, idea of what a, a window can do in Malachi he says I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you can that you shall not have room enough to receive so this open window became became a blessing to Rahab her family and even to the spies so they were let down out of the window and they went on their way. What was interesting, they told Rahab, when we come back, you need to have your family in the house and the red rope hung in your window. That reminded me of something that had happened long ago called the Passover. 
They were all told to have your family in your house. Amen. Take the blood of a sheep. This time they used the doorpost and put it over the doorpost. And when the death angel comes, they're going to pass over that family. And so for Rahab and her family, they said, when we come, because see, God, when he sent them over there, he said to kill everything and everyone. But see, when they came there, they were going to see that red rope, which represented the blood. Yeah, they, and, and, and when they saw it, they were to pass over that house. And all the family that was inside of it would be saved from death and destruction. You see, he rescues us. He saves us from death and destruction. He orders our steps. He takes those that, that are normally or, or would be rejected and then he puts them on a path of redemption and he rescues them from death and destruction because he has a plan and a purpose. You see, Rahab's story doesn't end right here. You know, I, I, and we go all the way to, to chapter 6. I imagine Israel, when they came across the Jordan River, which parted for them, by the way, God told them, march around the wall for seven days. And they had, I know they had a bomb worship leader like we do, RCF. And they was praising and singing around that wall. He said, and on the seventh day, walk around seven times. And when I say shout, shout, and oh, they were worshiping and praising, victory is mine, victory is mine. I'm sure, I don't know what they were singing. But when they began to shout and sing on that seventh day, the walls came tumbling down. Hallelujah. And they began to rush into the city. And, and they began to kill. I know that sounds awful, but these people were sinful. And what happens when you have not received Christ? Death is inevitable. And they were sinful and they came in and, and Israel came in and killed everybody. But somebody saw that red cord that represented the blood. Somebody said, oh, the blood yeah, that reaches to the, to the lowest valley. Uh-huh. Rahab, the prostitute. And, and, it, and it reaches to the highest mountain. Yes. It's the blood that saves. Somebody saw the red cord and they said, hold up. Wait a minute. Let them live. Don't kill them. Let them live. You see, when God orders our steps, amen, he saves us. He saves us for his plan and purpose. Oh, her plan and her purpose has still not been revealed, y'all. She was saved. And when, you, and when you look up Rahab, it's going to take you to the New Testament, right? In Hebrew chapter 11, verse 31, she's listed as Rahab, the prostitute, in the hall of faith, listed as a person of faith. And then it's going to take you to James chapter 2. And James talks about her as a person, and he calls her Rahab, the prostitute, a person with faithful action. Right? Oh, and it doesn't end there. Because God has a plan and a purpose for Rahab, the prostitute. Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 2. It says that Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab the prostitute. Hallelujah. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. Hallelujah. God works through those who we are inclined to reject. He saves 
Jesus for his plan and his purpose. And we skip down 25 generations and we go to verse 16. And Jacob was the father of Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Rahab, the prostitute, is in the line and the lineage of Jesus, the Christ, the Lion of Judah, the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the king of kings and the lord of lords, the chain breaker, the heart regulator, the mind fixer. Hallelujah. God works through those we are inclined to reject. Oh, come on, somebody. It doesn't matter what they call you. Because they kept, in, in every passage, they kept calling her Rahab, the prostitute. But God called her his own. God called her his daughter. God allowed her plans and her purposes to be revealed, not only because she hit the spies. Because let me tell you something, God could have went around all of that. And he could have hit the spies in plain sight if that's what he wanted to do. But he had a plan and he had a purpose and he has a plan and a purpose for you and for me. Amen. Amen. Who you think you are is maybe not who God sees you as. Tasha Cobb sings this song and it just says simply, you know my name. You see, that's why I asked that young man who his name was because I wanted to know he was of value. Yeah, I, and he didn't say I'm Isaac the crackhead. He just said I'm Isaac. Yes, hallelujah. And I said I'm Karen. I'm Pastor Karen. That's who God called me to be. Hallelujah. You know my name. God knows our name. She said, you know my name. You know my name. You know my name. You know my name. Oh, how he walks with me. Oh, how he talks with me. Hallelujah. Oh, how he tells me, yeah, that I am his own. That I am his own. Hallelujah. I'm not Rahab the prostitute. I'm not Karen the liar, the, the person that felt rejected by her dad. I'm not that. I'm Karen, a child of a most high king. Hallelujah. My father is in heaven. Hallelujah. And he's a good, good father. Yes, he is. He's a good, good father. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. And for someone that's feeling rejected or feeling like they don't know who they are or who their identity is in Christ, we'll have the ministers at the altar.